Welcome to tonight's talk. We are so glad to have with us tonight Larry Buchanan of the New York Times. He's a graphics editor, been with the New York Times since 2013 to share with us his expertise. Um, thank you, Larry, for being with us tonight. So glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. We can't wait. Um, before we get into our discussion tonight, we want to just remind everyone that if you have questions, to please use the Q&A. Mike Simmons will be kind of our helper in, in filtering some of your questions and feeding them to us as we go through our discussion. And um, we're just excited to hear what you have to ask him because again, Larry's here for you guys. Um, he is, he's come all this way, not for me, but for you guys. All right, so um, I'm just gonna share a screen real quickly to give us um, sort of something to look at besides our beautiful mug shots here. And I think I might need some help from our, from our actual host there. He's disabled my screen sharing, so we'll take one second. Ah, here we go. All right. There we go. And we will view that slideshow. All right. So, um, Larry, again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, as I mentioned, that you've been with the New York Times since 2013 and have been several other places before that. Um, a graduate of Indiana University, so you're a Hoosier, correct? That is correct. All right. Um, so there may be some future Hoosiers watching us right now. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, actually in our conversation before we came on here, you're talking about actually having attended a Herb Jones camp. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to where you are today. Um, yeah, I, I, when I was little, I, I, I don't know why I was always interested in, in newspapers and yearbooks and, um, making stuff maybe because I thought, or I guess in middle school and high school, it was the class where it wasn't structured. It always felt like the class where you got to structure the thing. There was like a pile of blank pages and some crazy advisor who was like, uh, those are for you and you should fill them up. And we were like, uh, what do we do? And they were kind of like, eh, we'll see what happens at the end of the week, you know? And I always, I always loved that. And I kind of fell in love with that feeling. Um, and yeah, I, I attended, I went to yearbook camp and newspaper camp and, uh, uh, and then later um, went to college for journalism and fine art at Indiana and studied both of those things um, for four years and then graduated um, and eventually moved to New York, where I got a job um, working for the New Yorker magazine. I had a friend who worked there. He sent out a tweet that they were looking for someone. I replied to the tweet that I thought I, I might be interested. He sent me an email. He asked me if I could come to Times Square to interview. I was doing nothing. I told him I could put on some pants and go to Times Square and and have and do an interview. And so I did that and have, and didn't screw it up enough. And they um, they offered me a, a part time job basically at the New Yorker magazine making these small interactive graphics. Um, and I made those for a couple of months, maybe like two ish months. And then a couple of people at the New York Times saw um, kind of what I was doing and I was posting on Twitter. Um, and they sent me an email and said, you know, would you like to come over for lunch? Uh, lunch was code for interview. I did not know that. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the lunch went well. And so they asked me to, um, to join the staff. So and that was uh, seven years ago. So I've been at the Times now for, uh, for seven, seven years. So enough for a whole presidential administration and almost an entirety of another one. Several Olympics in there, in between. That's awesome. Well, you, I mean, I've been looking at a lot of your stuff online and um, you have an amazing skill set that you apply. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about how you acquire that. But I thought maybe we might jump in early with some of the work that you're doing so that they can kind of see um, how you've applied your graphic design, your tech skills to what you're doing right now. And then we might backtrack a little bit to talk about how they could perhaps maybe um, you know, improve their skills and apply some of these skills to their work. So yeah, that's, um, that sounds great. Sound great. Okay. All right. So um, if you haven't been following the New York Times, um, here's a plug. You should. Um, 
And many of you probably um, remember that when the 100,000th person passed away to COVID, the New York Times did something very unusual. Um, and I think this was part of that, wasn't it, Larry? That, that whole front page plus the digital aspect. Um, can you speak to a little bit about uh, what that all entailed? Um, because it was a very monumental thing for the New York Times to do that. Yeah, um, it was, it really was. And it was kind of a monumental thing, you know, in, in just in the, in history, I think. And so we felt the need to kind of recognize it in some way, but I, I guess I'll kind of back into that story by saying that, um, you know, I work in the graphics department, my title is graphics editor and um, essentially it's not a great title. It, it, it does not really encapsulate Kind of encapsulate what we actually do. We're more like reporters who um, typically don't write long stories, but instead try to focus on any other kind of form of journalism first. So, um, in the case of this piece, um, uh, we had a graphics uh, a graphics editor, Simone Landon, who um, you know we've been tracking all this data and tracking all these deaths, and we knew we were going to hit a hundred thousand people, and a hundred thousand people is an unbelievable number of of just actual human lives, and because people are dying were dying are still dying so fast from this um you know we felt like we wanted to try to figure out a way to convey a sense of scale um and a sense of individuality right um we could there are a number of ways to try to do either one of those things right you could um you know have circles that are sized by the number of people that died in various places across the country you could use a bar chart you could um you know reduce those names down down into some sort of other form, right? Um, but ultimately that obscures the fact that each one of these people was a person, had a life, had a name and an age and an occupation and family and stories, right? Um, and so uh, that is, that's hard to do and also try to show scale, right? It's, it's hard to do those two things in tandem. Um, and so what we came up with eventually was this, uh, I sketched these little people, um, these, these little people icons, and we came up with this idea to, um, you know, try to represent each individual with kind of like an icon of a person, but then call out a thousand um, individuals. So 1% uh, essentially of the people that died with a name and some sort of signifier. So as what, as kind of what often happens with our work, um, if you're a reporter, maybe your first, your first instinct is to open up like a Word doc or a Google doc or something that you can type into, you know, and have long strings of text. And I really am a firm believer that the form in which you choose to start the story or the piece will ultimately kind of start to dictate what it will look like in the end. And so if you change that form at the beginning and flip what you start with, then you can all of a sudden have a much different outcome. So in our case, we're not going to start this piece with a Google Doc. We're going to start this piece with a spreadsheet. Um, and we're going to say, okay, row one of the spreadsheet. And then we're going to try to define what those columns are across the spreadsheet, right? So we need, um, we need to figure out who has died. We have a sense of where they lived. But one source of how and who has died are um, obituaries. And so we combed the internet for a thousand obituaries of people who died from COVID. And then you put those a thousand obituaries into a spreadsheet that's one row to a thousand rows. And then you start to break out those individual details. Can we find a name? Can we find an age? Can we find a state? Can we find a signifying detail? Can we add a link to that story? Uh, how can we confirm those things? Can we find another thing? Do we need images? So by kind of flipping the way we start this process, as, as opposed to say, we're going to write a story, then we're going to add some stuff to it. We like to start from, we have an idea. What is possibly the best form that we can tell that idea in? Um, and in this case, that form started out with the spreadsheet, as a lot of our work does, um, and, uh, and ultimately kind of took this form of this hybrid, you know, story graphic kind of treatment um, that we presented in this way online, and then in a very kind of very, very, very traditional, yet kind of unbelievably radical way in print. Yeah, when I was um, scrolling through this, and, and forgive us for not showing you the website right now, if we have time, I, I think we really definitely should go back to some of these pages because the the digital aspect does is so much, you know, more powerful than obviously these three screenshots. But at the very end of the project, yeah, there's that list of newspapers that 
just illustrated how much um, background research went into that. Do you yeah. um, have an idea of from start to finish, like time-wise, what you spent on something like this? Well, there are a lot of people involved. Um, uh, it takes a lot of people to go to, to get a thousand of anything. Um, and it takes a lot of people to confirm those details. Um, uh, you know, and what's, what's, what I do find so interesting is that it's our instinct to call that side of things um, uh, research, right? When it hits a certain level of thing, like all of a sudden when you're not just reporting for one story, if it was one story, we might call it reporting, right? And we just say, you're just doing some reporting. Well, essentially all we're doing is reporting but so much of it that we kind of transform that into like this word research, right? And in, in that sense, I would say that this is something that probably took us, you know, we knew the 100,000 death was coming and we wanted to mark that milestone. So we kind of knew it was maybe based on some projections that it was coming in like a week or two. And I would say we kind of put all this together in the span of, you know, maybe 10-ish days, um, something like that. All that being said, there's a lot of there's a lot of names on the on excuse me on the byline at the bottom. Um, it took a lot of people to get this done in that amount of time. But when um, you can kind of crank up the kind of architecture and machinery of the New York Times around a singular vision, it really is kind of an amazing an amazing journalistic machine um, that can yeah. produce unbelievable volume uh, very 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 quickly. Right. Um. I'm gonna ask you one more question. I'm kind of checking with Mike to see if we've got some questions. I saw somebody raise their hand, but I gotta ask you about the headline there and maybe also about kind of the, what was called the, the motivating factor behind doing work like this, but sure. this is kind of like higher calling work. I mean, you have a mission here that, um, obviously is pushed um this concept must be difficult for um i guess i mean you said you had so many people working on this um do you when you're talking about the concept is there a, a phrase that you just keep coming back to when you're working on this to drive you or is there like a unifying almost thematic element like you would have in a yearbook where you're connecting it to this greater purpose of doing this story I mean, I think in this, you know, in this case, our purpose is fairly straightforward and fairly simple, which is we want to, we want to tell readers that this is not a number, that this is jo not just a number, this number that is so huge and that you can become numb to and that I would say many of us are numb to still, that number is much higher than 100,000 uh, than 100,000 now, uh, it's pushing closer to 200,000. Um, uh, and that is an unbelievably large number. Um, and so I think that, that that was our driving kind of force behind this piece, which is, and that's a lot of the, the work that we do in the graphics department is, um, uh, I think falls into the bucket of small things added up, right? So we can take, there are isolated things, every one of these people, not everyone, but a th the thousand we found got an obit somewhere in this country, in a newspaper, right? Once you add those up, you get an unbelievable portrait of something much bigger than those thousand people. And we can do that with so many different stories. And I think if you look at that theme through our work, you'll see it over and over again. For example, we just did a piece about police brutality and the NYPD. There were these videos on social media from the first two weeks of the protest after George Floyd, George Floyd's murder that uh, that showed police acting aggressively uh, toward um, uh, toward pro toward seemingly peaceful protesters. Yeah. And and I'm what, trying to get to it actually. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump. Keep, the gun. keep speaking. I'm, no, I'll keep keep speaking. I'm I'm about to get to it. But what I think. The, the reason, the only reason I, I bring that piece up is because, you know, you can see these isolated incidents, but then once you add them all up, we ended up finding 67, I think, or 64 videos um, that created this much larger kind of undeniable portrait of what was happening. Yeah, that's the piece right there. Um, uh, what was happening during these protests. Um, and so again, this is, we can take a small thing, one video, and then look for all of them. And again, this piece started out as a spreadsheet, not as a story per se. And then we have to call every single person involved and say, did you shoot this video? And we interviewed more than a hundred people for this story um, to 
get a sense of the scale of this problem. And I think these, this is ultimately much, much different than that COVID piece in many, many ways. But in, in one very, very straightforward particular way, it's, it's actually quite similar. It's a small thing, an individual death or an individual police incident or an individual tweet from the president or an individual, uh, you know, an individual metric going up or down. And then we take those and we try to get all the data and add them all up. And then all of a sudden you get this much larger kind of grander portrait of a thing that maybe speaks to it being not isolated and much more widespread than anyone had thought. That's great. Mike, do we have any questions that we wanted to go to yet or? There, there's one specific and, and Larry coming out of the yearbook background um, is from uh, Carlsbad High School. What role do you think graphics could play in yearbooks this year? And I wonder, because I'm a photo guy, we're going to be challenged by uh, maybe not access to our people, to our cameras even. Is there an opportunity for yearbook staffs to embrace even more graphics? And um, do we need to be worried that we don't have the tools of the New York Times? Where do we start? <laughs> no, I don't think you have to be worried that you don't have the tools of the New York Times. The New York Times runs basically off of a giant Google Doc, so you all have it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of it's actually unbelievable the tools that are available to everyone, and there are very, very, very few things that we use that are pri uh, proprietary or anything like that. I mean, the, our CMS that we use is something that we made custom, but it's nothing better or worse than any other person's CMS. It's shitty in the same ways and it's good in some ways, you know, whatever. Um, but we use Google Docs, we use Google Spreadsheets, we use all the Adobe products, Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop. Um, and then we have some other things and I can send them to Chris and Mike um, uh, and they can send them out to you guys that we continually rely on. A lot of just simple HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to create these websites. Um, and to Mike's initial question, which is, could you embrace graphics more in a yearbook? And I think the answer is most certainly yes. Um, and, and ultimately, I think part of that is, again, a mindset flip. I think so often we think of graphics as extra to a story. Um, I think that in a traditional way, graphics sat in a newsroom, right? There was, there was a graphics department and then there were reporters and the reporters went off and did their fancy reporting. And then they came back to the graphics department and said, make us a bar chart, make us a map, put it in the story. And that got unsatisfying to a lot of people and a lot of people who thought that they had uh, uh, the skills of a reporter, but didn't want to tell stories necessarily in those long form um, article ways. And so by thinking about that slightly differently and by tweaking your frame and by not thinking about it as a story that has some stuff with it, but instead maybe some stuff is the story, uh, then that obviously is harder. It's harder to piece together what a graphic story is or how, how this looks because you don't have a mental image of it. But um, I would challenge you to try to think differently about those things. And I actually think that most of the people probably on this presentation are much more sophisticated about this than I am. Um, I'm not that old, and I, but I, and I have, but I have been working in journalism, you know, for the better part of the last decade, and uh, I work with a lot of people who are much older than me. And you guys are already doing this on your phone all day, every day. You are already telling these stories in different ways. Yet, when we go into a classroom, for some reason, we think that we have to write long things. We think that the only thing we need to do are write articles and then take pictures and add them to them. Why, why is that? It is, that is not the case, that is not true. And you probably don't read articles. You probably didn't, I bet you if I had a virtual hand raising thing right now and I asked you how many of you read an article from top to bottom today, I bet you out of the 100 people on this call right now, maybe five of you would have read an article from top to bottom. And I can't tell you how many of you spent more than three hours on this phone. This is where you need <laughs> to spend, if you want to make something that people will see, Make it for this. Make it for this. And that means different. That means use your use the images that you're capturing every day and, and tweak them in a slightly different way. Uh, add, take screenshots of Google Maps and draw on top of them. Um, you know, uh, use, use any of the Adobe programs or use Google Sheets or use Twitter or use whatever you can to create a compelling story sketch something out and take pictures of it with your phone and piece that together. Uh, I contend that you are much more sophisticated about this already than most people I work with. Um, and, and the people that figure that out and harness that in uh, a slightly different way, um, the key to it is putting it out there. It's like 
making the thing and putting it out there for people to see and judge. Um, uh, and doing that uh, uh, will, will allow you to stand out and, and will um, uh, get people's attention. Um, all right, so we wanna remind everybody in here to continue sending questions, um, especially about maybe how we might incorporate things in your book. If you've got something coming up and you're trying to figure out a new way to approach it, maybe visually, um, we'd love to hear some of your questions. Make sure that you're putting them in, in the Q&A. Um, I'm actually gonna transition to a, a little bit, we're gonna come back to that because that I know some people wanna um, talk about that. I um, have to ask you about this um, because like you said, sometimes it doesn't have to be overly complicated, right? Huh. Um, I, again, on the web, looks a lot different. But um, can you talk a little bit about something like this? What was the inspiration behind this? Um, and maybe, yeah, where where did this cool idea of these little, um, and I, I can tell that, that you're an artist at heart, aren't you? I think that's probably true. I tend to gravitate toward the ideas that, that are more, it, more artistic in concept but are accessible in form. Uh, so there's, there's some weird overlap there where it's like I have these abstract things in my head and then I try to connect them. The beauty of the journalism is that I can connect them to something real. They don't have to live as weird abstract thoughts in my head. And so that, that to me is kind of, um, is, is what I'm interested in is those overlaps and those, um, I write a lot of headlines first and then try to make the headlines line true or try to figure out if I have enough to, to, to support um, uh, uh, a headline um, in that way. So this, this uh, 54 ways the um, ways coronavirus has changed our world piece was essentially we have a morning news meeting every morning and um, you know all the desks go around and they report uh, the uh, sports reports what they're working on today and the foreign desk reports what they're working on and metro and graphics and styles and food and classical music and dance and real estate and everyone goes around the desk and gets, uh, you know, a couple seconds and they say their top couple things for the day. So after doing this for, this is, this was published in late May, after being, work, uh, you know, working from home for two months and hearing all of the things that the virus was changing, I just started to make a list of in the morning meeting every time someone said something was up or something was down. And we've made uh, many, 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 many complicated charts, many, many, many complicated charts of many things that have gone way up and many things have gone way down. And all the charts started to look like this. It was like that. Every chart you saw, it could be anything. It could have been, you know, wholesale chicken prices down, you know. Uh, it could have been, uh, uh, you know, COVID infections way up, right? And it was over and over again. It was like tr speeding up, traffic down, right? And so I tried to figure out if there was a, just a simple, straightforward, like what is, if I strip everything away, you know, I, I, I was having so much trouble in my head just reconciling what was going on in the world and how to think about what was happening, that if I could strip all of this stuff away, how, what could I pull away? What would I be left with? And ultimately, what I came up with was a little arrow, right? <laughs> I have this little arrow, and this arrow is either going up or going down. And I started to started to kind of play around with the ideas of pairing these things together. So there's no connection between identity fraud being up and mask wearing being up, but it's kind of funny. And and I put it together. Um, you know, there maybe is some connection between healthcare worker appreciation skyrocketing and healthcare worker pay plummeting. Right there, there's there was something kind of interesting about that those pairings to me. Um, and so I kind of made this list, wrote these down, and then started to move words around for a while until I felt like it it read more like a, you know, like a little poem instead of an article. Excellent. Um, so we've got some questions coming in here now, um, quite, quite a few questions. So um, let's see, here we go. Um, so from your point of view, um, a question comes in and says, which type of graphics do you think people are most interested by? Um, what as far as the feedback that you get from the work that you do, do you think resonates the most with people? 
Um, you know, it's, it's tough because I don't know that we think about it in that way in particular. I would say we think about these things more broadly in um, uh, what form is best to tell the story, right? And so oftentimes we'll run across um, geographic data and your first instinct is to put it on a map. Um, you know, we'll run across some standard numerical data and our first instinct is to say, make a bar chart out of it or something like that. Um, and I, and so, you know, I think that there's a certain type of like graphics nerd who is drawn uh, to odd off the wall charts that, that push data viz per se. But as you can see in the last couple of pieces that I've done, I, I tend to kind of run away from that. Um, uh, and I tend to try to push in maybe a more slightly unexpected direction, but still pared down. Um, I, I think ultimately I like to think of graphics as just an extension of words. Um, so if I wanted to be a writer, I would have to learn how to use Microsoft Word to do it, to express my thoughts, to get those points across. That's how I think about, I try to think about my work and I try to think about it in the way as the, you know, I'm coming across something, I can't not look at something and think that would be better as a map, bar chart, table, a uh, series of drawings with little arrows, a video. Um, uh, and that's what I say when I think most of the people on this call are probably more intuitive than that, uh, uh, more intuitive about that than I am. They're already using video and using photographs and using uh, graphics in a, in a, in some ways, probably more sophisticated way. Um, and so I would say that, you know, if you come across a bit, think about these things as pieces, not words first. Um, and then try to figure out what maybe works best around those things. So if that's a, a map, a chart, or a diagram, I think ultimately that gets you to a more expressive kind of story form um, and a more, uh, I think, closer, a closer reading of how these things could, should kind of like work and be expressed in our work. Um, that being said, people love maps. <laughs> people do love maps. Um, I agree. Um, I, you did that map where, or, or you, I guess you did, it was more of a graphic that covers the, um, the medium income, median income of the subway line. Yes. Um, so that's, that's a way to, to take, I guess, something that everybody normally sees and then add your unique perspective. There are a lot of questions coming in here about- um, Rapid fire, hit me with things them. You, Unique. So we've got one that says, you know, um, graphics can sometimes um, seem chaotic or unnecessary. Um, what's the way you can continue to keep them unique and fresh and easy? Um, great point. You know, as far as that, yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And I would say articles often seem chaotic and unnecessary. Um, uh, the words often seem chaotic and unnecessary. So instead of maybe stripping away the graphics, strip away the words and see what you're left with. Instead, you know what I mean? Just flip that. Just, just, in, just take the way, whatever you've been taught, and then go the opposite way for just two <laughs> seconds. Just, just completely flip that a little bit and say, I, I don't disagree. I think that graphics can go way too far. They can be ugly. They can be you know, crowded. They can, they can not do what you want them to do. And in that case, I don't think they're working. Edit them the same way you would edit a paragraph. Strip away and remove unnecessary words right? Remove unnecessary elements. I would say, you know, it, even in the Times, the Times style guide, we have the Times graphics department has no style guide, zero, absolutely none, because we don't want to over prescribe and dictate uh, uh, what our pieces should look like, because the piece you're looking at right now would not make it in a style guide. There's no way to define what this is. And so what we say is we have two typefaces, Cheltenham and Franklin, use those, and then we'll kind of like over time indoctrinate you with our style. Uh, and you'll get it to a point. If you go too far, we'll pull you back. And if you're not far enough, we'll pull you back. But basically, we want those graphics in so many in so many ways to just be an extension of the words. They just should be enough to say, this is better as a chart, this is better as a diagram, this is better as a table, this is better as a map. And then if we want it to also be art, that's a different story. We might push it more in the art direction. But ultimately, we want as much graphic as needed, no more, no less. <clears throat> Chris, can I, I add a cousin question from the chat? Definitely. Um, Larry, uh, turn on your yearbook brain, uh, old school. Uh, the question said, uh, Mr. Buchanan talks about how the process of the New York Times curates these large volumes of information to tell a more complete story. How can we apply that concept to yearbook since we mostly follow a ladder and the subjects of the stories we were gonna tell are gonna be determined in the beginning of the year. 
I would guess that a little bit of flexibility to the latter is going to be crucial. But, you know, if I dumped you into um, art class, the art class spread, how do you activate your brain to say, here's a potential for a graphics story instead of an article? I would love to be dumped into the art class spread one. That would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, and two, I think that ultimately there are, there are many, many different ways to kind of go about thinking about that. Um, I, I think that a couple of ways that you can start are trying to figure out these paradigms that you see throughout our coverage, you see throughout uh, uh, other, that you see run through other, other people's coverage. And I think that it's, it is just a slight flip of mentality, right? And I think ultimately what you need for that are some good examples that you can steal. Uh, and, some, and, and stealing, everybody steals, you should steal. Just completely rip it off and put your stuff in there. It's totally fine. Everybody does it. It's the way the world works. So what I would say is there are a couple paradigms that you can start to kind of mess with. One is the small things added up, right? So in an art class, if, if, you're, if you're on the art class spread, what are those small things that we could add up? The supplies, the, the, maybe the crayons, the markers, the paint. I think he froze. Yeah, Chris, you can hear me, right? I can yep. hear you. Oh, here he comes. He's back. Here Am I back? Yep. So the small things, yep. small things adding up, Larry. We weren't sure if you were asking or answering. Oh, no. I'm still hearing you, Mike. Yes, sir. Let's give it a second. Yeah. Are you guys there? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. yes we yeah, can. We can hear you. Uh -oh. I've still got you, Chris. Yeah, I got you too. I mean, no. We do now. It's in and out. Video is no good, but we've got your audio in part. Audio. Everybody in the audience, guys, thanks for your patience. Larry, if you can Thank hear you. us, I wonder about maybe leaving the call and we'll get you back in um, if maybe that would help. And while we're waiting, I'm going to show you a few more of his slides. Please do, yeah. Um, great questions coming in. Keep bringing them in. Yep. So this piece, again, like I'm a fan of his artwork. Um, he did things overheard at the new MoMA. Oh, there you go. There you back. Back, back now. We we're admiring some more of your artwork there. Speaking of art classes. Uh-oh. I think I might shut off, uh, Larry, I'm going to shut off your video in the hopes sure. that okay. maybe you're, can get maybe, some audio. maybe it's a bandwidth thing. Can you go ahead and try talking to us, buddy? Zoom's, Zoom's letting us down here, Chris. Yeah. Go ahead to the slides and. Uh, okay. Yeah. So here's another one of his, his works. Um, and you're talking about stripping things down. Can you guys um, hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yep. Okay, great. Or not. I'm going to text him, Chris. Right. Yeah, and Larry, okay. if you can hear us, I'd say leave the call. <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. And we'll bring him back in. Yep. I yep. think that would be great. Yep. Um, so I'll go back to show you a few more of the slides. Um, but these are just little illustrations um, with little quotes here. Um, and uh, obviously, you can really see the personality. Um, it's a fun story. Um, I think that these are things that you know you can you can also probably bring into your um, coverage of your school with quotes and things overheard and in different places. Um, just just kind of a, a fun fun way to approach things here. Um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way there. This is a story that I hope he'll talk about when he comes back. We mentioned it a little bit, um, but you know we're talking about sports um, and how sports coverage might change a little bit as we get into this year. Um, and this is a piece that he did um, where they really break down how one player um, approaches uh, um, 
scoring like no other player does, which is, is kind of a neat, unique way to, to cover sports, especially if you don't have time. We're back here. That's I'm back. Great. I'm there sorry. Is. Okay. Uh, no worries. No worries. Um, um, sorry. I think I was talking about how you can change things in your, uh, flip your mindset in your, in, in when you're talking about uh, yearbook pages to slightly think about different little, visual forms. Little stuff in the art room. How do you go with little stuff? So, yeah. okay, so little, so there's small things added up, right? There's so many things you could imagine that are, that, that you can kind of fit into that bucket, right? Uh, uh, any number of things. The other paradigm I would say is, is a very good one are collections, right? Collections of things that tell a story that are better than their sum of their parts. So uh, maybe don't feature the, maybe the art spread just becomes a grid of a hundred bad drawings. Maybe it becomes a grid of a hundred first drawings. Maybe it becomes a grid of a uh, of, uh, hundred uh, day one drawings and a hundred at the end of the semester drawings, right? Maybe it becomes one person's project spread out across the entire grid annotated in a whole bunch of different ways, right? So there are, there are tons of ways I, I think that you can start to approach these things. And um, I would look at things like magazines uh, and look at things like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, especially kind of like weird. If you have a, a good magazine shop in your town, go and look at the weird magazines and they're the ones that are often doing this kind of better than others. Um, but there are, there are a number of things you can do that are not just straight up type. Um, uh, a series of, you know, a series of photographs, annotated photographs, uh, collections of things, uh, small things added up, um, you know, uh, a series of charts that tell some story, one chart big that you annotate across several things. Uh, uh, I could keep going. Great. Um, we've got a, a, a question here um, that I think goes back to some of the slides that we looked at. Um, it says, Larry seems to use a ton of white space and it's beautifully done. How, how do we balance graphics and layout when space is to a premium in a yearbook? Um, so since we don't have an a, a infinite scroll, um, where does that balance come? Yeah, totally. I think it, um, it depends a little bit on the stories that you're trying to tell and whether or not they lend themselves to, uh, uh, you know, kind of open and spacious. But I would also challenge you and say, why is space at a premium? What is in that book that you don't need? Can you cut it? Uh, and, and in some sense, why are you beholden to some tradition of whatever? whatever? Insert whatever that is. And look at every step of those things that you just took for granted when you walked into that room and then say, okay, can we rethink maybe the beginning? Do we have time to rethink the beginning? Can we, can we uh, you know, uh, even the concept of a ladder, right? Like, do we need that? How do we upend that? Should we change the whole thing? Should the book be a ser five small books instead of one big book, right? Uh, and the question of, of white space on a page, sure, maybe it feels a little bit um, beside the point, but I think in some cases, you could, you could use white space throughout the entire thing. It could be a defining feature of the book. You could have, the book could be a hundred small portraits instead of, you know, instead of what the book is. Um, uh, uh, you, you have that chance to reinvent that thing and anyone who decides to do it will win all the awards and, and, and do all the things. I mean, if you blow up the portrait section, that'd be amazing. Please do it. Somebody do it. <laughs> Somebody do not do a standard yearbook. Just do something completely batshit insane and it will be fantastic. You have nothing to lose. You're a junior in high school. This is the year to blow up the portrait section, although there might, there might be some unhappy parents out there. We'll so be, be it. Portraits. So be it. The parents aren't happy about anything all the time. Right. We'll, we'll give them your contact information, Larry. I will happily field all of those emails. I do not care. I would love for someone to blow up the yearbook. Um, from my point of view, I'm sure that um, you as a New York Times graphic designer would have a little bit more uh, credence than, than me as a teacher, but we're going to move on. <laughs> Um, I think you all, I mean, you all have the, you all have the credence though. And I guess I'm not saying okay. blow up the entire thing, but there, I think you have to go so far to make the point, right? That, that there are so many things that you take that you just do because a yearbook should do them. I would question all of them and decide which ones you think are actually true. 
Love that. Love that. Um, we have a couple of sports related questions. So I brought this, um, this slide up with your um, Sam Kerr story here. Um, one of the questions deals with um, tips for incorporating graphics and sports spreads. What are your general tips for that? Um, and another person asked um, earlier, um, when you're developing your plan, where do you go to find inspiration to tell the story succinctly and, and, and through the visual element of storytelling? And maybe this topic here can address both of those, um, uh, again, with this, the Sam Kerr story or another story that you did um, on sports or something related to how you involved infographics or graphics. Yeah, I mean, sports are ripe for this kind of storytelling. Again, I think this is a is another example of of not thinking of it as an article first and thinking of it more as a piece or as a as a you know as a um, uh, as a piece of journalism that we're trying to figure out the best form for, not necessarily an article we're trying to add things to. So in in this case, the Sam Kerr piece, the kind of big moment in this piece is is this one goal sequence. Uh, that we break down and annotate, right? So the frame by which we say Sam Kerr can't stop scoring, we give you kind of a sense of who she is and why you may or may not know her. We show you a couple of small things, but then ultimately there's this large sequence um, in the middle that is, is the kind of meat of the piece, which is just one goal broken down and annotated. Um, and how she scored this one goal. You know, we interviewed her, what she's thinking, how she's feeling, uh, so on and so forth. So that could be uh, uh, a, a um, an entire sports section, right? Uh, uh, a theme that you run through the entire sports section. One play, one play in volleyball, one play in football, one play from field hockey, one play up, you know, one shot golf, right? That's That could be a theme that you run through the entire section. And all of a sudden it's not an article, it's an image uh, that's accompanied by little arrows and lines or something that uh, that deal with uh, the person, all the people involved. You interview everyone in, everyone in one photo. What were they thinking at this moment, right? That could be, that could run through an entire sports section. Um, and those are all just kind of, those are photographic ideas. Those are visual ideas. Um, uh, uh, as far as information graphics go, sports is, you know, chock full of statistics and uh, 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 all of those kinds of things lend themselves to many different types of charts, right? Uh, goals over time, uh, you know, comparing them to previous seasons. Um, and, and if you can go in deep on some of those stats, you, may, you might have to keep them yourself or track them yourself or go to the coaches who, um, who manage those sports and, and deal with those uh, uh, and deal with them and get data from them. But that's a great way to just even inject some small things, small bar chart, small line chart uh, throughout a spread that maybe tell some trend or story through that. Um, Larry, I just got a text that's off the QA. So we're going like informal here from an adult that said, Love get him it. off the art class and give him other topics and just let him rip. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Larry. Okay, I, improv know, graph. I'm happy to improv you know, graphics well, editor. It's we one sensitive. of my favorite things to do. <laughs> we want to be sensitive to uh, to our camp director, Mimi, and, uh, of and course. the advisors that have the other thing. But I was chuckling like, you know, chemistry lab, Larry, go. Uh, golf club, Larry, go. <laughs> Opening happy. night, Larry. Um, that said, you said you write the headline first and then try to prove it. Can you, how, how do you write a headline first? We, I, I advise my kids, get the whole story and then you figure out what the hell it's called. Flip sure. That script. Yes. Well, I think in some cases, yes. If, look, I think we're, we can be talking about two different things. Of course, I don't want to write a headline for a breaking news story and then try to make it true. Uh, that's a completely different you know, kind of, um, you know, a kind of beast, right? Uh, but in the sense of a feature story, of the sense of a thing that goes in a yearbook, you're not, you're not really telling the story of every moment. You're heavily editing, extremely editing the entire year and putting it into one thing. But you're picking what goes into that thing. And so the headline for the art spread does not have to be the same headline that it's been for the last 27 years, which is, Art was made in art class, right? Uh, it can be a hundred bad drawings, and then you have to make that true. We need to find a hundred bad drawings, and then we need to get people to comment on those hundred bad drawings, right? We could do a hundred bad drawings for any single topic you give me. I mean, there's there's a hundred bad drawings for chemistry. There's a hundred failed chemistry experiments. There's a hundred failed flubbed lines at the school play. There's, I mean. 
that's a whole theme you could build an entire yearbook around. Just the number 100 and you spread it out across the whole thing. And then you, you find 100 examples of each little bucket and that's every single page of the book. Um, or do 50 if you think 100 is too hard or whatever. But that kind of thing is what I'm talking about when I say it's possible in these feature stories to write a headline or come up with more, more accurately probably a concept um, uh, and then try to, to fulfill the promise of that, um, of that concept. Thank you. Chris, back to you. We've got five minutes, friend. Okay. Oh, yes, we do. Okay. Um, we do well, I'm going to throw this one. I'm going to throw this one out here because um, it's one of the uh, last questions that was asked in the series here. What's the craziest thing you've ever designed? Uh, craziest thing? I've, well, once I did a drawing for an encyclopedia um, that The Onion put out. I don't know if you guys are familiar with The Onion. It's a satirical um, newspaper. Uh, and I did a drawing of a, uh, a coal-powered wind farm. So this cutaway diagram of a wind farm that was being powered by a little guy <laughs> shoveling coal into the bottom of it. I also drew a beaver dam full of dead bodies for that same uh, book. I've got to ask you, um, <laughs> what's the reaction from your editors when you... Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I would love it, right? Um, is there, has there ever been any... Um, yes, I get told no a lot. You do get told no a lot, okay. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I, uh, I, yes, right. I, I often have ideas that many, 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 the vast majority do not get published. <laughs> um, I, there was a question here, but I, I don't know if this question actually applies to you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How so, do you usually deal with inspiration block? Is there a time when you have just completely? Yes, you know? I do. And the way I deal with it, I try to actually deal with it on a daily basis. Um, I, I go, when I go, I go on a walk and I try to take pictures of one thing over and over again. So I go on a walk and I'll say, okay, this walk is window walk. And I'll take pictures of 15 windows. And then I'll go on a walk and I'll take pictures of uh, every time I see the color red. And then I'll go on a walk and I'll take pictures of like 15 leaves and I'll go on a walk and I'll take a picture of the moon between 15 buildings. And I, I go on these little picture walks to break inspiration block. And then sometimes I post them to Instagram. Speaking of which, um, I think if I click on my slides here, I've got oh one of your Instagram posts. <laughs> so. This is another one of those, this is another one of those, you know, I wrote the headline years ago and I'm still trying to make it true. Uh, right. I post a photo every single day of whatever I'm looking at at 345 and I don't edit it at all and I've been doing it for four or five years. Um, so you get a sense of my day at 345 and I was looking, I opened the fridge at 345 on this day. <laughs> That's excellent. Chris, I don't um, know you, but I'm getting texts asking us to keep him here for the next five hours. Yeah, I am happy. I am happy to. I'm happy to stay for as long as you need. So if you guys have to get off, just cut me off whenever you want. But I have nothing to it do. Said encore, <laughs> encore by someone. Um, so, um, well, let me let me ask you sort of some some last uh, questions for them. Um, so you know, you've had such success as a professional. Um, you know, graphic designer, journalist. Um, what What do you think are some steps that our our, our students um, should consider if they want to get into this field? I would say, um, you know, I I I would say that if you're interested in this, I I find myself very 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 curious about weird little trivialities in the world and I like to fall down these rabbit holes um, where I'll spend way more time than I needed to overhearing people at the Museum of Modern Art or way more time than I needed to tracking all the things that went up and down during the beginning of the pandemic or right now I'm really really into the signature boxes on mail-in ballot envelopes because they're all designed really badly and that's gonna cost a lot of people a lot of votes in the general election. And so I'm trying to get all of the ballot signature boxes on the mail-in envelopes from every county in America, right? 
if any of those things seem remotely interesting to you and you feel like <laughs> you want to fall down these rabbit holes, then I would say that this is a fantastic job and profession for you to get into. I will say it is not easy. Um, it is stressful. Um, it is the, you know, the money is whatever what it is <laughs> um uh but it is a fantastic job to explore your curiosities um and to get paid to do that i feel extremely lucky every single day um that to me is the is is so 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 great um and so if you are curious and you are interested in those kinds of things i don't really think the form matters at all but when i mean go deep the everyone can stay on the surface. So few people truly go deep. And if you can go deep, that is a sure way to win, right? And by deep, I mean getting every single ballot signature box thing from every county. It takes work, right? Or there are so many examples of this. Like there's this guy on Twitter who all he does is post uh, changes in, in NBA uniforms, or, or not NBA, all sport uniforms. He just ritually monitors it's called uni watch every uniform change in sports and now he's like the uniform change expert guy and now he's got a database of uniform he went deep and he won on that you know there you can you can go deeper and that is a sure way to win there are other ways to win but since i only have two minutes that is the fastest way go deep and be curious and that will i think you will you will find yourself successful um, in this field Well, uh, I, I, I know that personally, I have gotten so much out of this, Larry. I am inspired. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, from someone who said in 2013, I make charts to explain things. Um, I, I still trying, now, still trying to prove yeah, the headline. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, the, the questions are still kind of pouring in, but, um, I will you know, say you, you're on social media and somebody asked you, are we allowed to follow you on Instagram? <laughs> um, but you have a Twitter presence too, right? I, yes, I don't tweet that much. Um, uh, and I actually have another Instagram account that is more of the main one. That's kind of the side one. But um, I will say I am happy to answer any question from anyone to talk to anyone. Um, uh, my email address is L-A-R-R-Y b-u-c-h at gmail.com um, and it's on my portfolio website it's on the times website you can also email me at my times email if you just click um, uh, 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 contact reporter um, it'll send an email to me i'm happy to talk to anybody so if you have any questions or any feedback you. or need feedback i'm happy 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 to help thank well thank you so much i know from the hundred plus people that were with us tonight um, we cannot thank you enough for doing this. Um, we are very inspired. I, um, uh, I'm looking forward to bringing these ideas back to my students as I'm sure all these staffs are as well. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. From Yearbooks at the Beach, thank you. Um, Larry, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Mike, because you are the grandmaster of Zoom. <laughs> no, I just hit the record button. Uh, I just wanna echo again, Larry, thank you so much. And thanks for the generosity of the students being able to email you, that's that's massive. And, and of students course. watching, um, it's there. Do I have time for one more story? Yeah, hit it. And the advisors oh, that yeah. go to round table can go yeah, to Yeah, they can leave, yeah. <laughs> one, more, one more quick story, and, and, and I will, I only tell you this to tell you, uh, to, to not be shy about emailing people. I, when I was in college, um, uh, the Times published this graphic about um, uh, some, some uh, speeds at which people, at, placings at which people finished in winter sports events in like 2000, I don't remember. And I was so taken by this piece. I thought it was so amazing. I didn't understand what it was. And it was just this, this weird little graphic thing that seemed to have like its own thought and its own idea in this nice little package. And so I emailed the, the woman who made it and her name's Amanda Cox. And I just emailed her out of the blue when I was in college and said, what is this? Who are you? And how do I make something like this? I think this is maybe what I want to do for my job. And um, she generously emailed me back and said, my name is Amanda. I work at the New York Times graphics department. That's, this is what this is and this is how we made it. And, and, and now I work with Amanda <laughs> and I sit near very close to Amanda and work on projects with Amanda all the time. And she was so generous 
in just replying to that one email. And it's not hyperbole to say that that one email truly changed my life. Um, and so I am happy to do that for any other person, even if I can help even one iota. So please do not be shy. I mean that actually seriously. Words to live by. Um, we're all clapping, Larry. Uh, you they can raise their hands and, and, and whatever else. But thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks for being a part of your books at the beach. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.